Hello, and warm greetings to all of you there at the International Conference at the Dungui Borgum. Unfortunately, because of the current pandemic situation, I can't be with you there in person, so I'll be talking with you by video today. <clears throat> My name is Michael Stanley Baker, and I'm assistant professor at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And I also serve on the Council of the International Association for the Study of Traditional Asian Medicine, which provided me a wonderful opportunity to visit Korea during its 400th anniversary of the Nungui Bogum in 2013. That conference was organized by Professor Kang Yong suk and it's also by his kind invitation that I'm also able to speak to you today. So, thank you again, Professor Kang. I would like to speak to you today about digital tools for studying the distribution of medicine in early Chinese sources, in particular reference to a text, the Ben Cao Jing Ji Zhu. And I'll be talking about multiple kinds of distribution. Geographic distribution, where did the drugs come from? Social distribution, where, uh, who used the drugs? And textual distributions, in which texts do they appear? And what can we learn from these different movements of these material medica? But an interesting aspect of my research question first occurred to me at the Dungui Bogum Conference in 2013. It was here, in the beautiful medicinal park in Sanchong, with its terraced hills of medicinal drug plantations, exhibitions, libraries, and this mock model of a traditional medicine, medical clinic complete with medicine drawers, dried herbs hanging from the rafters, fresh herbs laid out in the square, and even a mannequin patient waiting to be seen by a doctor, which you can see him lying there on the veranda. <clears throat> I'd attended the exhibit with my mother, who you can see here, standing alongside uh, some drying herbs. As we were observing, we asked the docent what the herbs were called, to which the docent replied, well, it's Donggui. And we asked, well, what is that? Is that Donggui? And he said, I don't know. I don't speak Chinese. And we pressed further. Is this um, good for menstrual problems? Is it used to strengthen deficiency of blood? Does it move the blood? And then he replied, yes, yes, it does. That's the herb. So then we asked, if that's the case, then why is it that the roots that we see here are so thin in comparison to those that we see in dried form when they arrive in ph Chinese pharmacies. It appears that the roots are actually made of a much darker, a much thicker cut material. At that point, the docent then replied, ah, well, you see, this, these drugs are in fact are not the Dongwei that we're talking about. This is a Japanese varietal which has no uh, medicinal value. We just like to eat it, and we're going to have this later. So, this exchange and this transformation of the nature of the drugs that we we're looking at brought out two important elements for me. One is that knowledge is embedded in relationships. Things are not as they are simply on their own. They become what they are through our relationships to them and also to each other. It was only as the docent got a better sense of who we were that his answers began to change. The definition of things change, changes depending on who is asking and for what purpose. A dangwe is not a dangwe, is not a dongwe. Secondly, things vary depending on their location. Bringing our knowledge of Chinese medicine to the Korean landscape, we brought technical categories which led us and the docent to produce a false impression of uh, what was going on. And it wasn't until we began to pursue the uh, inquiry further that our horizons finally met. <clears throat> With this in mind, we can look back at the statement by the Tang Dynasty pharmacologist Su Jing in his introduction to the first uh, state-sponsored materia medica, the Xin Xiu Ben Cao. When plants and animals leave their original grounds, then the material will remain the same, but their efficacy will change. At first reading, we might think that Su Jing is talking about material drugs and the changes themselves as they degrade along their journey. He might also be referring to how these drugs will interact differently with the local qi of different landscapes, moving from a cold, dry climate to a hot, wet one, for example, 
or as these drugs are used on bodies of people who inhabit these different regions. However, we can also consider further that there is social change going on as well. People in different locations may think about the drugs differently, using them for different purposes, or they may go through adulteration by traders as they want to re-represent these drugs as new commodities as they travel into different regions. The scholars Lisa Onaga and Harry Wu talk about this moment, this time and place where lively matters become important and reified in particular cultural, scientific, and humanistic contexts in different ways to different actors. And they refer to this as the Genba, or the Xiancheng, or the Hyongjiang. This time and place which is inaccessible to readers of the future uh, after the moment is um, full of multiple definitions and multiple representations of the materials themselves. And it's this complex dynamic by which things come into being through uh, social interactions that is the focus of their study. And it's also retaining this complexity is, I think, of, of critical importance when we look at how digital work is being done today. <clears throat> One of the things that we find is that there is a common tool that we use in our research, which is called the search term. We take a particular term and we plug it into a database and we can search across hundreds of texts to discover how many different actors used a particular product at a particular in their sources. And yet what this does is produce a, con a construct, the illusion that the term Dongwe means the same thing to all of these people in all of these different contexts and times. How can we use digital tools to become more cognizant of the variety of ways in which these objects were used differentially in different times and places historically? So it's with this in mind that I'm going to introduce you to new forms of digital research that I, <coughs> which I propose as a new step forward for textual studies. It is the digitally annotated edition of a 5th century text, the Ben Cao Jing Ji Zhu. Although this text is now freely accessible online, it is of an entirely different order than a text that is simply copied and pasted onto a web page or a blog. Marking up the text, that is, categorizing all of its contents with these colored digital tags that you can see here requires the in-depth skills of textual studies of close reading Middle Chinese, paleography, Chinese medical theory, historical geography, as well as the understanding of how to store, manipulate, manage, display, and publish the data. To give you some sense of the difference between this text and just the simple plain text that we would find on a website, these seven, these seven lines of text that you see here, ranging from here down to here, <coughs> actually conceal much greater amounts of code, these 35 lines of code. About roughly six to seven times the amount of data is embedded behind uh, the encoding of these texts. In presenting this text to you today, I want to propose that the digital text, the marked digital text, is a serious product of professional philology and digital humanities. It affords many new dimensions of study and analysis that are quite different from a paper edition, which can produce interesting new insights that were hitherto impossible to find. So I offer this text to you today as a fundamental research, a primary source that can be used for wide-ranging types of secondary study. The source text, the annotations, and a number of geographic visualizations, as well as a searchable, searchable database are now publicly accessible for you to download and explore for your own research. We simply ask that if you use the data or tools, that you just please cite the material appropriately. I will describe today how we produce the text, give some demonstrations of how to use the software and analyze the data, and in so doing, point to the kinds of new insights that can be gained. The Ben Cao Jing Ji Zhu was compiled by Ta Hongjing in the year 498. However, it was more than just one text. It contains three different textual layers. So we actually have three texts in one. Initially, we sourced an online edition and then made detailed comparison with an existing critical edition, recorded in detail all of the substitutions 
where print characters differed from the digital and made substitutions of our own in the digital so that the text was fully searchable. We then marked up the text in close detail using regular categories that we discovered in the text. Here you can see them in their different colors. And we used these categories. <clears throat> we have the, the main drug name, which starts out the, the, the head of the text. Um, you can see indicated here in red. And all of these other categories, the drug property, drug actions, the methods of preparing the drug, the geographic place name, harvesting methods, etc. All of these details are embedded into the text now. When we marked up the uh, geographic locations, we first studied the, the, their locations in this dictionary by Paul and Schultz. And we read through the textual descriptions of where the places were located, and then went on to examine the GIS locations and find those in Dharma Drum and, and Harvard and Fudan's um, China Historical Geographic Information System. This markup was all performed in Marcus, the leading sinological text markup software. It's extremely convenient for marking up geographic locations. As you can see here, we can use Marcus to search up geographical names. Let me show you here we can see all of the different tags of the categories that we've been using. And if I pick out a geographic name, for example, Lan Tian, um, here we've already given it its geographic tag, um, but we can find it, we can circuit, search it online uh, via the online databases using tagging within Marcus, using this code within Marcus. Here we have a variety of choices to select from. I can zoom in here, find near Xi'an, these various locations. And each of these tags have different historical boundaries which, uh, for which that place is, was considered, um, that had that name. Um, now, my text goes range between the year 200 and the year 500. So we've selected this text um, and, the, and this tag, which you can see replicated over here. It's the same tag here. However, if we don't find it in the Harvard database, we can also search in Dharma Drums geographic database, where there are similarly recorded um, geographic locations along with their time boundaries. Text is divided into individual passages, <clears throat> each of which is headed by a primary drug name, seen here, marked in red. All of the other tags relate to that specific uh, drug. These markups, which are available for you to use online, can be downloaded as an Excel table. Here you see the main drug name marked in yellow, and all of the other tags from that specific passage are all correlated to this primary drug name, of which there's only ever one in a given passage. <clears throat> there are drug properties, different actions, different actors, special diseases, etc. Now, while it's extremely useful to use Excel to, parcel, to parse this kind of data, what it makes difficult to do at that point is then go back and see how this data plays out in the original passages. And for this purpose, we use DocuSky. Um, it's a text database that has been produced by National Taiwan University specifically for sinological texts. So anything written in kanji, hanja, um, you will be able to use and search within, these, uh, within, within this format. When you, when the text first, when you first open the text, it will appear like this. And what you can then do is go here in the top right and select tag. And that will reformulate the, 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 the page so that you begin, can begin to see the tags and their contents listed on the left hand side. Now, as you can see here, um, I can scroll through the variety of different tags that are available. I'm going to select actors to look at the social distribution of the drugs in the, in the period. And you can see here the topmost uh, category is Daojia or Taoists. If I select this, uh, click on that selection, um, it will then give me a reduced list. Here you can see that the query uh, is now limited to uh, Daojia and that there are 22 total results. <clears throat> I can then reanalyze these by going to examine, for example, drug actions. And by looking at the drug actions, I can begin to see what kind of 
drugs were of interest to Taoists. And here you can see fairly typical uh, dis uses of transcendent drugs. For example, they strengthen the qi, uh, they lighten the body if you take them after many years, they extend your longevity, again, they prevent aging, um, they also brighten the eyes, bright eyes, um, cong and ming, um, the clear, uh, clear vision and penetrating hearing were considered signs of transcendent uh, attainment. Again, you have strengthening the qi. Here you have um, preventing starvation, which is useful for if you are uh, living in the mountains, doing austere practices. Um, and then later on you have uh, getting rid of uh, demonic parasites, etc., uh, etc. Et so we can get a general characteristics of the ways in which Taoist drugs are presented within the Ban Cao Jing Ji Zhu. Now, if, for example, I want to go and look at how other actors have been using it, I can go here and select Undo to go back to my original selection, which was the entirety of all of the drugs. Now, once it is uh, reformatted, I can then go back to look at drug actors again. And here we have another important category, uh, which is Fang Jia or Recipe Masters. So I'm going to select this. And you can see that my query is now reduced simply to Fang Jia and that there are 17 total matches. So I can then look through the, the different types of uses that Fang Jia use for these, re these recipe masters use for these drugs. Um, so let's select here the drug actions. And then I can begin to see that the topmost category is not longevity, but it's pain in the limbs. Um, here we have dispelling pathogenic uh, heat and cold. Um, we have stopping thirst. Uh, here we have benefiting the qi, benefiting the jing, the essence. And here we have um, getting rid of parasites. But you see less of these longevity uh, promoting drugs. Further down, however, you do, do see them occasionally crop up. In case here's one that lightens the body and enables longevity. Um, so if we want to compare whether these uses were, whether the Taoists and doctors were, uh, Fang Jiao were using these for the same thing, we could, for example, go down here to this one, Yi Qi, uh, benefiting the Qi, and narrow down our search further. Here you can see we have Fang Jia, and then that has been narrowed further down into Yi, yi Qi, or benefiting the Qi, and there are only two matches which result. You'll see that the highlights here in blue are all um, of the drug properties. Now, I want to see if Taoists are using these properties. So I can go to, go here and select um, actors, and then what it will do is highlight the other actors who appear in these passages. And we find that, in fact, it is uh, not Taoists, but uh, medis doctors of this generation, as well as recipe masters, two separate categories which seem to be contrasted in this text. Um, and here in this other passage, there are no other actors, there are only uh, recipe masters. So Taoists and recipe masters do not appear to be using um, uh, drugs to benefit the qi in the same way. One of the other things we can discover is the geographic distribution of these drugs. Now, uh, once I select the category place, you can see that there's a number of geographic locations and we can even begin to display them on a map. However, there's more, um, there are more elements about mapping these drugs that I want to show you uh, using a different platform. One of the things that I've mentioned before is that the text is divided into three separate layers. So as we've been studying the text and analyzing it, we've also made attempts to parse it out into its different layers. Here you see marked out in green the layers from the Mingyi um, Bialu, the, the middle layer of text, and here in red we have the Shen Nong Ben Cao, uh, sorry, we have Tao Hongjing's commentaries. And what we've done is extracted the place names from each of these so we can begin to see the geographic distribution of these drugs as the drug market has changed over time. And this map shows you the place names of the drugs divided into three different categories. You can find the <clears throat> just the layers of the Shen Nong Ben Cao, the earliest textual layer, and one of the things you'll notice is that there's actually very few uh, drugs. There's only 
three drugs in total that are that are um, described in this data. When we add the Mingibialu, we find that there's actually a great deal more drugs. And when we finally add the um, Tao Hongjing's commentary, we find that the geographic spread extends far out into Manchuria, to Mongolia, to the Central Asia, and into Southeast Asia. So <clears throat> already we can begin to get a sense for the, the, the expansion of drug knowledge in these different layers of text. I want to point out a few different features, however, <clears throat> is, it, as we begin to look more closely it, at the topography. I'm going to use this um, button here to uh, this move the map around. And then I can zoom in and zoom out. Now, one of the things you'll notice is the outsized point here, which is completely un invisible um, up until this point. It wasn't, I don't, I'm not sure that anyone has ever done research on the extent to which Taishan dominated the drug marketplace in ways that no other location does. It has a total of 43 drugs listed here. Now, one of the things you'll notice with this tagging um, feature is when I click on the tag, it, this little top menu pops up. And if I scroll over here, you'll see that the drug name is a star because you cannot list multiple entries on the tab, tab itself. Uh, so you can um, select here to uh, view uh, the data more fully. And in this case, you can see uh, again that the information that we've discovered, um, that it's located at this place with this particular address, Taishan. But if you want to know all of the drugs that are here, you can download the entirety of all of, the, all of the drug entries. And now we can see all of the different names and locations. So that shows you how you can capture data from specific points that may not be described in the display. <clears throat> One of the other elements I want to point out is the role of local geography, which again was invisible before we could map out this, um, before we could map out these points. And as you'll notice, there is a concentration, a strong cluster of drugs that is moving along here. And it so happens when we look at these locations on the map that they follow the contours of the Yellow River. So we begin to now have, through this uh, edition, this digital edition, we begin to have evidence of the role of local uh, waterways as well as trade routes because it is obvious that these have become popular, uh, popularly known sites for locating drugs because of their accessibility to the trade route. Again, what if I want to capture some of this data? This tool here, um, let me scroll in, this lasso tool will enable us, let me do that here, this lasso tool, capturing that, enables us to then go onto the map and select, a variety of drugs from the region. Once I've selected all of those, I can then take the pop-up and look at the data by clicking here. And I can get a full summary of all of the different location names that you see here and the addresses, and an even fuller summary of all of the different drugs that appear at those locations here. These are now down, you can now download these and do further analysis of the proximity of these drugs to trade routes uh, in early medieval China. However, I want to point out one other aspect of this, uh, of this mapping system is, as you remember, um, if, I click on, if I click on a particular location and there are multiple drugs listed there, you cannot actually uh, see them in the top listing. So I've developed this second map here called Find Drug Name. If you click on that one, each of the drugs is listed uh, individually and they do not count the locations. And this enables us to see all of the locations in which a single drug will appear. For example, if we want to look at, um, at, at uh, up here in Liaoning, uh, Liaodong, I'm sorry, I can click on this point and then I can move down to the drug name and then select Renshen and then you'll see that it highlights out all of the other drugs that appear and we can also begin to know 
a little bit about the changing geography of the ginseng trade over time. Here you have these two blue points, which are from the Mingyi Bialu, which date between 200 and 400 uh, AD. And it is only at Tao Jing's commentary, close to the year 500, that we begin to have uh, f much more foreign locations appear, such as, um, such as Goryeo, uh, which is listed here. Uh, here we have Renshen. So here we have Goryeo, and here we have Pekche listed down here. So we can again get a better sense for um, how these drugs were, were understood to be located over time. Now, if I want to get a further picture of, um, for example, drugs that were available around the Yellow Sea, what I might do is select this circle locator and draw a general graph around here to get an idea for drugs that are on the periphery or available. And I can select that and just wait for two seconds. And you'll find, again, here we can pull out uh, a sub this subset of drugs which are on the on, on the coasts and e extract the full data um, and we can extract a summary of all of the locations and we can extract a larger summary of all of the all of the different drugs that are that are listed there then if you want to do further analysis you might for example select uh, a, a number of drugs from here that you're interested in or drugs from a number from a particular location and then you can go back to the DocuSky text and begin to search for those drugs in here and get a better sense for um, for what is available. Let me give you an example. If I reset here I can then select uh, drug uh, main drug name um, this one and then I can look down here for ginseng. And here is, for example, ginseng. But I could select a few other drugs as well that I want to get a subset of. And once I have all of the drugs that I want, I can then filter them by using guolu. And now you'll see I have four, the, the four different drugs that I've selected. And if I want to learn about their locations, for example, I can then uh, select place here and then choose to map them and get a sense for the distribution across here. But I can also come back and look at the primary texts to, to understand more about their uses and do close, detailed reading comparison. So that concludes my presentation. And I hope that I've been able to demonstrate to you how, um, by through digitally enriching these texts, we can make them uh, speak to much broader dimensions of Chinese history that now the Ben Sa Jingji Zhu, I hope, is, will be relevant to scholars not only of Chinese medicine, but also of geography, sociology, botany, religious studies, economics, and political history. All of these dimensions become accessible through the production of these new kinds of materials. It's my hope that the data here is useful for scholars working on this time period and that this methodology moving forward will be much more far-reaching and enable many kinds of enriched studies of the interrelationship between medicine and the broader history of China, East Asia, and the world. But I want to conclude by just thanking people who have been involved with this project. <clears throat> most uh, significantly in the, in the most the recent year, um, Xu Duoduo, uh, has been involved in doing the detailed character checking and re-editing the markups. Um, and William Chong has been helping with the um, analyzing of the text into its different periods and the construction of databases and a, a lot of important technical support. But behind the scenes, in the original er versions of this text, I've had support from Chen Shipei in the Max Planck Institute, um, Brent Ho from the State, Berlin State Library, who's worked, taught me a lot about uh, how to work with Marcus, and Joey Hong, or Hong Zhong Zhou from uh, Dharma Drum, who initially helped us with parsing the text into three different layers and with initial layers of markup. And fundamentally, uh, I want to give a shout out to the, my friends at DocuSky, um, the, the, at the Research Center for Digital Humanities at National Taiwan University, the team 
who uh, has been working on DocuSky very hard, has produced a phenomenal tool which can not only work with my text but with any text in the future. And I do hope that as we move down the road in the digital synology that we can continue to produce similarly analyzable text and begin to develop a new modes of textual scholarship. I've also received institutional support, I should add, um, from Dagmar Schaefer, who first funded the initial layer of this project at the Max Planck Institute, and um, Hilda de Wert, who is constantly extended support uh, for my work with Marcus. <clears throat> and the most recent years, uh, the, the, my work since I've arrived in Singapore has been supported by the Ministry of Education here. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you for your attention, invite you to, uh, to view our texts uh, and to play with them, um, to do exciting new research with them. I would love to find out what you discover uh, as you explore the geography, the sociality, and the different properties of the text. Thank you very much.